you know, so what if someone said, oh, I really like Joanna's work, I really like Yarrow's work, and I really like John Lee Dumas. I like his stuff too. So what if I feed, I download their RSS feeds from the last 10 years of all of their content, and I upload that into my model, and then I, I say, okay, I want 20% Joanna, 40% Yarrow, and 40%, you know, John. Um, output stuff in, in that way. What can we do about that? Welcome to Yaro's podcast, where you'll discover the stories behind world-class performers, business builders, and enlightened leaders. Hi, this is Yaro, and I'm so excited today to have a guest who appeared on my show. I can't remember, probably the last decade, that's how long ago it was, but I have such an exciting topic to talk about with her, and it's all because she has been absolutely geeking out about this subject. But not only that, she's actually a very well-respected author and teacher coach to other aspiring authors. So I'd like to welcome back on the show, Joanna Penn. Oh, thanks for having me back on the show, Yarrow. It's, I'm excited to talk to you today. Me too. I mean, uh, you know, I interviewed you a long time ago when we told your entrepreneur's journey story. So I, I'm going to just say we'll put in the show notes, you can go learn about what Joanna's done, which is probably a lot more since you did that interview because that was a while ago. But the basic story of how you got your start in this world of blogging and business is there. I do want to talk about what we're here to talk about today, which is AI, artificial intelligence, and how that is going to change content in particular. And just to give people some background, Joanna well, two things have happened. She's been constantly bugging me to go read all these AI books because she's like an AI super fan at the moment. But more importantly, she wrote this great article on her blog about these nine points. I'm just going to read the title out because you have a great title on this blog post. Nine ways that artificial intelligence AI will disrupt authors and the publishing industry. And I feel like we can almost interchange that as well for you know content creators, any kind of writers or content producers. And you have nine points that I'd love to dive into. But before we do that, let's just talk about one thing that this is also a selfish question because I, yeah, you gave me some advice. I was talking to you about my other company, Inbox Done, and you suggested, why aren't you doing a book about, for that company as, a, as just simply a, you know, a, a lead generation exposure tool? And I was like, hmm, that's actually a good idea. So we're working on that behind the scenes right now, myself and my co-founder, oh, Claire, right? So <laughs> following your advice, thank you, coach. And I kind of want to contrast, I guess, a person like myself or myself and Claire who are about to enter the current space of being an author versus what you think will change with these nine points. So just as a summary and as a coach to yourself, with Claire and I about to enter that world, how would you advise us in a nutshell to get the best result from our book? Obviously, we're going to write it ourselves. What's a summary for today's world of publishing? <laughs> Such a big question, Yaro. <laughs> yeah. In, in <laughs> two I'm, minutes, please. <laughs> in two minutes, yeah. So there's two, there's a lot of decisions, obviously, to make around publishing now. And this audience, the audience that listened to you, and of course, I've been one of your listeners and learned from you for many years. So the people listening are either entrepreneurs or they are wanting to be entrepreneurs. So they generally have that entrepreneurial spirit. So there are still reasons for traditional publishing. So just to be clear, traditional publishing is where you might find an agent, you know, find a publisher and go through maybe six months to two year process of working through the traditional publishing system. Now, it's very siloed by territory. So you might sign a US Canada deal or a UK Commonwealth deal. And they are very good at physical bookstore distribution. So this is a really big point. If you want to be in every Barnes and Noble in the USA, then traditional publishing might still be the best way to do that. But obviously, as we all know, that is decline. Bookstore sales are declining as sales move online, and certainly now more print books are sold online than they are in bookstores. So another reason to go traditional publishing for you might be, or for other people listening, is if you want to be a speaker. And many speakers will get the traditional publishing deal in order to have the hardback book, you know, the business card, the booker's business card model. And especially if you're not concerned about income, then traditional publishing might be an interesting way to go. But of course, they take the majority of the royalties for doing the majority of the publishing 
work. Now, just to be clear, everyone has to do their own marketing however you publish. <laughs> so to contrast that to the independent publishing reach. Now, I don't like the word self-publishing. Self-publishing is great if, say, you're helping your kid at school do a book or you're publishing your grandma's war memoir diaries or something. But independent publishing is treating publishing as a business, but you're doing it as an independent. So you are basically running your own micro publisher. And that's what I do. So it is for those people who like to run a business. It's those people who like control. You can change your book cover. You can update the content, which of course we're used to. You can also make a lot more income. For example, Amazon and most Apple places like that will take uh, 30% instead of a publisher taking 90%, for example. Also, one of the other big differences is it's a global digital and mobile economy. So for example, I have sold books in 86 countries, which is far more than most traditionally published authors because I can publish in every single country in the world. And the other thing, just finally, before you come back to me, is there are so many options now. I know a lot of people listening might be in the US, UK, Canada, Australia, you know, Amazon is dominant in those countries, but the rest of the world is where the growth is. So there are ways that you can now publish in print, in audiobooks, as well as ebooks globally. So those are some of the major differences. And of course, what I should also say is you can combine these approaches. For example, you could license your print rights to a publisher for US market, and then you could independently publish in all the other markets and all the other formats. So it's a very flexible environment. The main question to always come back to is what do I want to achieve with this book? Right, which would lead me to my next question. But I do want to shout out and correct me if I'm this is not the best place, but your author's blueprint is still the best entry point to kind of learn everything you just talked about in more detail because you are a book coach, right? Well, I'm not really a coach. I don't do any one on one except with special people like you. <laughs> but I, I do have everything for, you know, for free, as you say, on my website, thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. And also there's an ebook on every ebook platform called Successful Self Publishing. Okay. And yes, I use the word self publishing because that's the word that's in <laughs> common usage, right, right. as we all know. Okay. Well, we'll link to those in the show notes, of course. And I, want to reiterate, please do listen to the first interview with Joanna just to hear her background story and get some more advice as well on, on independent book publishing. Let's take the story forward. So let's say Claire and I sit down together, we get this book written, we have a finished version, we probably self-publish or you know independent publish, so we have global control. And, and I'm frankly not sure we could get a book deal for this topic right now anyway. Maybe that would be down the line. Our expectation then would be this would start to obviously appear on Amazon, probably get an audio version done. So it'd be on Audible. And then it would be our job to get exposure for it. So appear on podcasts to talk about our book, maybe appear on print in radio, television, if, if we can, right? And then the hope would be that since for us, it's a tool to get more customers to our business, people would start discovering that book. And then some of them would choose to approach us to possibly become customers. So that, that's a kind of a nutshell outcome, right? Yeah, that is the classic non-fiction book business model, which is you're not in, you know, aiming to make a lot of revenue from that book. It's actually a very specific book for very specific people. And so it will be your marketing for that. As you said, podcasting is great. You can find podcasts that, for example, are aimed at those who are not just starting out because, you know, I know I, I'm using Inbox Done and it's fantastic, but it's not something you use when you're, you've just left your job or if you still have a job or whatever. And you're, you're trying to do this. So I think it's great to think about who's the target market for this book and where can I reach them? And also the markets you want to reach. So, you know, again, we discussed there US, UK, Canada, Australia, maybe you start with those markets, but maybe there are other markets you also want to move into. So you can target your advertising on all of these different geographic locations. There's so much in book marketing these days, but that, that, those are a few tips. Okay. I'm I'm probably going to ask you more questions off the uh, call for, for my own personal <laughs> self-interest there, because <laughs> I don't want to dive into uh, the topic that you have so much content out there for everyone already. But I think we should switch now because it's a perfect time to dive into the future. So let's jump forward, maybe 10, maybe 20 years. I'm not exactly sure how long. You probably don't know either. But you have these nine points. And already the first point you mentioned in that list comes into play with this sort of story I'm telling about myself and Claire writing a book for our business. Your first point is 
And again, if you want to follow this, we'll put in the show notes. The nine points will be there, but I'll read them out for now. Uh, number one, nonfiction books, blog posts, and news articles will be written by AI. So just before we answer that, just to give the background, how have you come up with these nine points? I have been like mainlining audiobooks and podcasts and just really delving into this. I think I've I've been interested for a couple of years now. Peter Diamandis had a book called Bold, which he put out, I think maybe five years ago. He's got a new one actually coming out in 2020. And that started me down the journey of learning about AI. And he has Singularity University, which uh, is a fantastic blog. And then last year, or uh, well, two years ago, oh gosh, it's even three now, when Google's DeepMind beat Lee Sedol at the Get Chinese. Chinese game of Go. And I remember, and I'm, I'm getting goosebumps again thinking about it. <laughs> I remember hearing about that and realizing what that meant. And so I just couldn't believe that no one was really talking about this. So essentially, up until that point, machine learning had been, well, it hadn't been machine learning, it had been program computers to do this, and then they will do that. So chess games, for example, you can just program all of that different stuff and it will output it. But what happened in that game of Go, which if people don't know, it's a very ancient Chinese game, is that the AI came up with a creative move. They decided was a creative move and beat the world champion at Go. And when I realized what that meant is and and what it was is that it learned from playing it this was not an ai based on programming it was based on learning so it just it learns from some games and then it played itself and then you know they kept iterating and iterating and of course deep mind got bought by Google. And so that to me changed my perspective on what AI was going to do in terms of creativity. And and then I read Kai-Fu Lee's book, AI Superpowers, which is how I got you onto this, which basically he explains how China has, has almost completely retooled their education system since that point in 2016, which is why everything is now accelerating and accelerating. So this was a slight interest about three years ago that has now turned into a sort of all-consuming manner where I, I just devour this stuff on a daily basis. And I'm very enthusiastic. You probably tell. <laughs> I, I'm not a doom and gloom AI person. I'm a happy, happy AI person. <laughs> well, you say that, but some of these points can be easily perceived as doom and gloom for us writers, authors, <laughs> content creators. So so definitely worth addressing them. But yeah, I appreciate your AI geekiness coming out here, Joanna. This will, this will be fun to talk about with you. I want to throw in, if people haven't seen it, the AlphaGo documentary. I'm pretty sure it's on Netflix for most people. I think it's called AlphaGo. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I watched it a year or so ago. And I do remember this palpable feeling of almost like a, a sadness for the human race when it got beaten, when the champion got beaten by the computer. And, you know, it wasn't just the player feeling depressed. It was like everyone else watching was like, oh, you know, this real sense of we don't matter in some ways. I don't know what it was. I felt it too. I'm watching here going, why is this making me sad? You know, what, <laughs> what, what's going on here, you know? And, but it's uh, really important to reframe that though now because okay. that do. is true. That's true. And you see his face and you realize he has this realization that he's been beaten and is devastating. But what's happened since then, and this is why, and we'll talk maybe a bit later about the the idea of the centaur. But this is what happened in chess when Deep Mar, you know, Deep Blue beat the Gary Kasparov years ago. What then happened is that a new industry of centaur chess has arisen, where a human with a chess robot or a chess AI is now how they have their own tournaments, they have their own creation. And what's happened in Go is I've read some quotes. I think I put one in the blog post, which the guy said this has transformed our understanding of the game that we have had as pretty much set in stone for thousands of years. Mm. And he, he described it as something like, we thought we were at the mountaintop of our knowledge of how this game, this almost spiritual game works. And now we can see the next mountaintop. And so they are embracing this. It, that moment, of course, was devastating, but they have changed that into, right, how do we change the way we do things and learn how to work together with the AI? And this is the overarching theme, I hope, of, of this conversation is it's <laughs> using the tools. Right. I can see the the, the story arc here from the, the book we're making in this podcast, Joanna, where <laughs> we're going to talk about the doom and gloom 
but the conclusion is that human augmented by AI is the path forward for a better life for all of us, which also means a better AlphaGo player, a better chess player. You combine a human with a computer and they will beat the human by itself or beat the computer by itself, which I guess still gives us hope that we're involved in, in the process. <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> Somehow. Somehow. Yes. And, and let's, um, let's talk, come back to this number one point because okay. you know, I, I do want to explain to people like where we are. So it's already happening. <laughs> so text generation AI is already used for a lot of journalism, um, particularly at the moment in financial markets and sports journalism. And even I know you love tennis and this year's Wimbledon, IBM's Watson, which is their deep mind, uh, does, you know, their AI did all of the editing for the tennis TV. Now, I know this isn't words, but it essentially did a first pass edit, which saved a lot of time for the human editors of the tennis. But it was the first time they use this tool. But in a lot of these, you know, places like Bloomberg, Forbes, I think is another example, there's a whole load of tools that they're using for first draft journalism. And then I also wanted to point out, I mean, we already have music, we have art, we have screenplays, we have poetry, we have novels, nonfiction books, the first AI generated textbook has been written, all of these things have already happened. But I feel that so much of the AI reporting is around the more technical aspects that the arts are being ignored to a mm. point. But I do want to also talk about GPT-2, which is a terrible, it's not even a word. I mean, they just should have come up with something better. But GPT-2 is this natural language generation model based on training an AI with a lot of word data. And you can play with it at talktotransformer.com. So talktotransformer.com. And you can go in there, you can type in a sentence. So Yarrow, you could copy and paste a, let's say, three lines from your blog and put that into Talk to Transformer and then press generate. And I suggest pressing it a couple of times and having a look at the type of things it generates from that prompt. And what's happened is when they originally released it, it's OpenAI who have it, and they released it and they released a very small model and it wasn't very good, but they have recently released a bigger model trained with more data and it is pretty impressive, I think. And they have another model which has a lot more data, but they say it's too dangerous to release because of the potential. But inevitably, it will be out there. So this is why this is important. It is already happening. So we have we have to be engaged with this topic or all these companies are just going to do stuff and we will be shut outside of the development process. So that, that's why I think this is so important to engage with. Okay, so let me ask you this. As a person like yourself or myself or a good chunk of the people I've worked with in my programs over the years, we're experts at a subject. And we currently would sit down and write a how-to article for our blog to teach how to do something. And then we do it again and we do it again. And we slowly grow this audience, possibly through some you know good organic search results in Google, maybe sharing on social. And we built this authority site that's a resource on how to solve a problem. You do it for book writers. You know, I do it for people who want to make money from blogging. I've got students who, you know, whatever it is, it's how to recover from acne, how to speed read, travel hack, whatever it is. Are you saying that there will be a computer who will be able to write all the blog posts for these kind of people in the future? Or is that too far fetched? No, I, I think that's already happening. And if you or I were able to access some of these tools, the problem is I would love to try so many of these tools, but they are proprietary or they are held by, you know, they're too expensive for individuals like us. But if you're a big company, you can license some of these tools. So narrative science, for example, or automated insights, these are companies you can license for your you know, your magazine or your, you know, you have a magazine and I have a magazine. That's basically what it is. It's just on the internet. Right. So, or a newspaper, whatever you want to call it. But that's, that's all it is. It's just in a different format. So why I think this is exciting from our perspective is that I want, <laughs> I want a GPT-2 for my content. So both you and I have, well, you have even more than me, but I have over a decade now of content in my voice. I would love to train an AI with my decade's worth of content and have it spit out first draft articles that I can then edit into other things based on a prompt. Now, the question then becomes, well, this, and this is why we can come on to number two, the copyright law, but how, you know, what if somebody else wants to use my content, which at the moment 
you know, a lot of people do, as you know, download it, upload it, whatever. Or can we license our models of natural language generation? So this, <laughs> this is the point. I Again, there's so much that as we go through, we'll talk about this more. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I have one burning question still that I'm, I'm still stuck on with this, even before you get to the copyright aspect. I get the idea that they could take some of my existing writing and create a piece of content that sounds like my voice. But the essence of the content, like, you know, let's just say I was about to write a topic on traveling, blogging and traveling, because I've just been doing that. And I want to share some unique stories from my travels. Only I've lived those travels. How is the AI going to be able to produce that? Or are you saying it's not about specific content that you want written? It's more like you need constant fresh content and it can help augment what you already do. But my you know, my storytelling can't be replaced because only I live my stories. Help me clarify that. Well, I agree to a point, but I also am your friend on Facebook. <laughs> and I have seen you posting pictures from your travels, including, you know, food you ate, some comments on your emotional state. We all put this <laughs> stuff out into the world. So if you have an AI that is Yarrow AI, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Yarrow.ai. Oh, I like him already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like him too. This is the thing. If you say, right, go get my stuff from Facebook and Instagram and and you know maybe you have um you give it access to your personal email i mean there are some big things here around what potential you know potential privacy and data issues but in the end of the day you're going to put out a blog post on your blog which is in public about your personal situations now again i think an ai could learn from your blog a lot about you I mean, we've heard about it from Cambridge Analytica, how few data points are needed to pinpoint your personality and your preferences. So I don't think there is anything that it can't do as a first draft if you gave it access to that data. And it needs I know that data, might... though, right? Like you can't get away yes. with this. If you're a chiropractor who's got zero presence online sure you've written emails before maybe you've written a book so that could be something you've done but maybe you haven't then it's you're going to struggle a little bit though the ai will struggle if there's nothing to draw from initially right well and this is where you and i and what you've taught for years is so important because this is where the voice is so important there is no way that an AI cannot write a 10 point listicle on ways chiropractic can help you with your back pain. I mean, you don't, right. I mean, seriously, you can find that data all over the internet. Right, that right. is not personal at all. And, you know, I think we've had peak content in terms of <laughs> listicle repetition. So that type of stuff is easily gleaned, you know, from data sources all over the place. The main question is, how do we double down on being human and that is our personal stories and our not personal get sued, books. right yeah and yeah not get sued but i think we can both admit <laughs> that a lot of content online has you know a lot of it is not very personal so you yeah. know people get it from wherever they get it it's going to be too big to sue because it'll be too many sources like an ai could draw each word from a thousand different articles and yeah, put exactly. together a thousand. Uh, yeah, okay, that's scary, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, should we should we move on to number well, two? No, I like what you were saying, but let me let's just quickly re recap. We might have lost a few people here. So, first of all, <laughs> this, I know it sounds silly. What's a listicle quickly, just so people know? Because <laughs> that's a oh, funny it's, word. <laughs> it's like I said, like ten ways chiropractic can help you with your back pain. You know, it's uh, ten points or seven points or whatever points you want to make about a particular topic that a you'll find post. all over the internet. Yeah, yeah. a list post. Yeah. A list. Okay. So to recap, you're saying, first of all, that nonfiction books, blog posts, and news articles will be written by AI. And this can even be people who have never produced any online content. They could go online, tell their little AI bot to go find, you know, the 10 points that they want for, you know, chiropractor or sore knee or headaches or whatever your specialization is, how to cook a vegan gluten-free brownie. It'll pull that information from other people's content online and give you a draft, which you then could quickly personalize. But it would seriously in speed up the research, content creation, and you know, writing of the article. So you're really just having to give it one final polish, make sure as you're about to say, it sounds like you. So put the personalization into it and then you can publish it. Now, point two, you're saying copyright law will be challenged 
as books are used to train AIs, which then produce work in the voice of the established authors. So yeah, now go, go ahead, Joanna, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, copyright law is, for, again, we might, I don't want to lose people here because this is not boring. Copyright law is actually how authors make a living. We write something original in the world and we license that in different ways and that's how we receive income. So this is huge. It's the same for photographers. It's the same for anyone creating anything, including our blogs. So I cannot copy one of your articles, Yarrow, put it on my blog and say, I wrote this. That is against copyright law and you could sue me for that. That. However, this is what's very interesting. At the moment, there really is no copyright law around AI. In fact, the monkey selfie, do you remember this monkey selfie picture? No. No? Okay. Well, any, anyone interested, Google monkey selfie. So basically, this monkey picked up a camera by a cameraman and took a picture of itself with the guy's camera. And the question became, who owns the copyright to that picture? Because the cameraman didn't take it and it doesn't belong to the camera, can it belong to the monkey? And I know it sounds crazy, but this, this can be important. <laughs> and essentially, they said, no, copyright has to belong to a human. So in that case, I don't even know who got paid for that photo, which was used all over the world. But in this, and this is very interesting right now, it was, I first read about it in Wired. So basically, you can train these AIs with data, right? So let's say you want to train, and we'll use music, you're going to train an AI with the entire back catalogue of Beyonce. And then you're going to tell the AI to create a new track based on its data. So this new track has no single set of notes that are Beyonce's, like it's not plagiarism. So there's nothing that's copied and pasted from a song. There's no lyrics which are copied and pasted from Beyonce's lyrics, but the machine has been trained on Beyonce's music. If that AI now releases a song that gets to the top of the charts, who should get money for that? It's not Beyonce's, mm. but her her music has been used to train the AI. And so this is important. This is actually starting to be discussed now. So Audible, many people will know Audible. Audible is being sued right now for captions. So essentially, Audible has the rights, so has uh, licensed the right to audio versions of people's books. And what they want to do, it's just been stopped legally, is put captions generated by AI on your phone as you're listening and they say this is for educational purposes i think it's a great idea <laughs> for in terms of the final result but they're being sued by all the big publishers who are saying you don't have the right to do this because you don't own the copy you know that you haven't licensed the right to the book in text format and they are coming back and saying we are not using the text format we are generating the text with ai so that is not the text copyright. So, and again, this this is as as we speak right now. This has not been resolved. It's in it's in the the law courts. So, where we're going with this, and coming back to us personally, what if? So, I have, you know, so what if someone said, "Oh, I really like Joanna's work. I really like Yarrow's work, and I really like John Lee Dumas." I like his stuff too. So, what if I feed, I download their RSS feeds from the last ten years of all of those their content. And I upload that into my model. And then I, I say, okay, I want 20% Joanna, 40% Yarrow and 40%, you know, John. Output stuff in that way. What can we do about that? <laughs> so this is, this is mm. why this becomes very interesting. So I am very pro licensing. I think licensing of copyright and licensing of things is very important because when people aren't able to purchase legally, that's when we get piracy. Mainly, most people are not pirates by nature. They will pirate when they can't get it in a useful manner at a price that is appropriate. Mm. So I would like to say, I don't know how to do this either, but you know, is there a way that we can license our work in ways where people can use it in models like that? And just one more thing before you come back at me. Um, the other thing that's very important about this is all these models they're building like gpt2 they are training on work that is out of copyright now most work that is out of copyright is written by white men because most published work because it's remember copyright is generally 50 to 70 years after the death of the author so if you think that 70 plus years ago 
most of the published work in the world was written by, you know, white men, unless you want to translate things. So why I also think this is important is we need diversity to train our AIs. We need, you know, diverse voices, women, people of colour, people of, you know, different sexualities, etc. So that's why this is important. So I don't want to just say, right, shut all that down. This is where the regulation is so important, mm. I think. I'm trying to postulate on a possible future here or, or a very likely future, I guess, based on what you're saying. I think back to maybe 10 years ago. I mean, it's something that's been said every single year to me, I think, as I've been a content creator. But even 10 years ago, people were saying, how do you stand out? Because there's so much content, right? And like you said, peak content, which is the period where there's way too much content for any one human being to possibly consume. Not only that, we have so many options. It's no longer about finding content. It's about sourcing the best content to answer a question, hence the rise of a, a search engine like Google. This, to me, based on what you're saying, just adds another layer or almost an exponential growth to the amount of content that will be produced, which then further exacerbates that issue of finding the answer or the what we hope is the best answer or at least the sufficient answer to whatever we're trying to do. Because I can imagine you know, we go to a Google search in this new world that you've painted and there's human written content, there's AI written content. Since AI written content is so easy to, you know, doesn't require human labor to produce, it's going to magnify the, the output to incredible levels. It's going to be so much more difficult for engines like Google and so on to determine what is the best thing? And that to me is the most important question for someone like myself who's really benefited from Google sending me free traffic for well over a decade now as a way to discover my work. And I think you'd say the same thing. I mean, I know we, we branch out into podcasts, but I honestly, you take away Google from, from my business, there's no way social media and podcasting gets close to replacing that as a source of audience. And I also know partially the answer to this question, you're gonna talk about the loyalty of a community who, who know you and you're gonna say, you and I can then use AI to augment what we provide for our community. But what about the step before that, the discoverability, the initial, you know, I don't have the community phase for an individual content creating entrepreneur or author? How, do, how does that going to change? Yeah, well, you're right. And that's actually my number six, my point number six. Right. <laughs> which shall, is, shall we jump ahead then? What is point six? Yeah, we'll, we'll just jump ahead and then circle back. So yeah, yeah essentially, you're right. Content will explode um, and we'll come back to translation and all of that as well. But what I also believe is that AI will aid discoverability. So, you know, you mentioned Google there. And just last month, as we discussed this, so in August 2019, Google announced their indexing podcast episodes, for example, and the rise of voice is becoming more and more important. So I think what will happen as more AI discoverability tools come in is because of the ability to index a lot more data. So if you think that 10 years ago, the way you know, you could almost at that point still get on the front page of Google by doing SEO keywords in white on your homepage. Mm. I mean, we were at that point of hacking. We are we are way beyond that point of hacking. And that is a good thing because what this AI discoverability will be able to do is we won't have to write a list of keywords into a WordPress plugin, you know, SEO plugin. It will be much smarter. And it won't just be, again, this is also about diversity. I, I've been asking the question to people, do you hear you represented online? So Yes, people listening to us now, maybe we represent a part of their personality, but maybe there's a part of them that is not represented, that they can be that person. So, you know, me talking about independent publishing this year as a white woman in her mid 40s in England is completely different to a Nigerian woman in Nigeria who's just discovered self publishing at this point because so much is different. So, I don't think anyone listening should be afraid that it's too late. I actually think, again, that AI is going to bring us many more opportunities in a, I think we're in the, in, actually in this difficult place right now because content has exploded exponentially, but the discoverability tools are not mature enough to enable us to find the right content. Mm. So I was just a podcast movement 
and they were talking about a lot uh, about intent and also uh, the sort of concept of where you are and what emotional frame of mind you're in so that they can serve you the best content for you at that moment in your situation. And we have to have a lot smarter discoverability to get to that point. If you see what I mean, mm. it, it has to know more about us and there have to be more options. Again, you know, we know about health, for example, that many of the health recommendations are based on a certain nationality, certain body type, you know, certain gender. Whereas you could serve different results if you know more about the person who's searching. So I, again, think AI will help with discoverability, mm. but also curation is becoming super important and personal brand as as we mentioned yeah this is this is tricky for me to kind of guess because i understand the world we live in today and i could say personal brand voice uh unique experience all these factors go into what makes your content stand out those are things i've been espousing for years to people on coaching calls you know that's how you differentiate yourself you're joanna penn no one else can be joanna penn you know you you have a unique creative ability to tell a story, whether in fiction or when you're sitting down and writing your nonfiction stories. But what you're telling me, Joanna, here is AI will do all of that and much quicker and it will be creative. It will be the creative pen AI, not just, you know, create the creative pen. And and then I look to the discoverability engines to differentiate between the creative pen AI and then just the creative pen. So Joanna versus Joanna's AI and which is giving the better answer to a question versus all the other AIs out there. I can't comprehend the algorithms that would determine what's a better answer. And I understand what you're saying. There'll be more personalization in the search in the sense that it'll somehow maybe gather a lot more of your social data first as a way to determine how to give you the best answer. But I look at it today. In fact, just yesterday I was reading a newsletter um, by Mark Sisson, who's a you know big keto health kind of person. And he would gave, gave this table from a, another alternative health expert pointing out the changes recently in Google search results, basically favoring the more, I don't know how you say this, the mainstream medical websites like WebMD and very much devaluing the more alternative health style websites in terms of search queries, right? So sending more traffic to these sites and not the the other ones. And you know, these alternative health people are, are like, well, sure, we, we can cite official research documents as a way to increase what the search engine sees as you know a more trusted source of information. But at the end of the day, Google's actually not really looking much more than citations to try and determine, you know, what's more critical in terms of a value metric to say this is a better answer to your your health query, you know, and already reading that go, that's not good enough. That's terrible because it's using these almost, you know, things you can fake. It's devaluing things almost because it's got like a social value on it, like alternative health is not as good as, as traditional medicine. So that to me sounds like we haven't got a good answer right now for our current situation. So you magnify everything by a billion with all the extra content coming from AI. I have no, I can't fathom how you can come up with a good, you know, AI search engine. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, that's why we're talking about 10 years time. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, who Give me the I? answers <laughs> now. <Give> me <laughs> yeah, well, and this is why this is interesting. I think, you know, I, like you, have a business mainly based on organic traffic, which is why I am heavily into this, because I am trying to prepare for this future and get ahead of it. Now, no one's saying this is not, this is hard to fathom. But 10 years ago, let's say 20 years ago at this point, nobody could have seen the internet as it is now. And you and I could not have talked like this just over a decade ago. Well, was, let's say 2007. So 2007, when the iPhone, when the Amazon Kindle, when things like Skype, that really changed a lot of stuff. And you were already into things then. And that's when I started building myself as well. But it's very hard to think how we run our businesses now compared to what it will be like in 10 years time, if we have a very different space. Mm. So that's one thing. The second thing is about say, I think the medical example you've just given is a very specific example in an industry that at the moment is consumed by the anti-vaxxer discussion. So I don't think that particular example can necessarily cross over into many other 
domains. I think that's a really big deal that they've adjusted. I mean, they've also done the same. They've also tweaked the algorithm around things like anti-Semitism so that people can't hack their way to the top of Google with a fascist website for a Jewish search term, for example. So that's manual manual changes to the algorithm based on certain things. Mm. Whether or not that's good or not will have to be up to the individual listening. I would say my husband is Jewish, so clearly I have views on that. (laughs) But the other thing is, we talk about, you know, the creative pen AI or the Yarrow.ai. I'm not suggesting that this is some separate thing. What I want to come back to is the fact that writers use tools. So we have, you know, I have on my desk here, I have a journal and a pen. I have a laptop. I have a microphone. These are um, you and I are talking over the internet. We are using tools to run our business. So that's what I see AI as. It's, you know, many people, Kai Fu Lee, for example, talks about AI as electricity. It's not something that just does something on its own. You have to create the box that it goes within. You have to create the thing you want it to do. So even if you train an AI model, if you feed in the whole of Yarrow's RSS feed for the last 15 years, you still have to direct it to create something. And then you have to then curate whatever comes out. So don't think of this as happening without your your interaction this is what like we said the centaur version which is where we create together so think of it as a tool and hopefully that won't be so scary mm. <laughs> thanks yeah <laughs> i don't know like i said it's it's hard when you're grasping on the unknown and it, it, for me it's not the unknown about the content creation tools it's the unknown on the discoverability side because i know how hard it is for our people, you know, our, our students, our followers, to get their book discovered, to get their blog post discovered, you know, to grow this initial community. Because it's easy for us once we, 10 years later, we're talking about having these communities and, you know, there are our, our, our super followers and that's an asset we've built over time. But someone entering the space, especially, let's say, fast forward 10 years, and sure, they've got this great AI version of like a content generator as a tool, like you're talking about, but I'm really wondering, and I know we can't answer the question, what's going to be the methodology for marketing or discoverability for new content creators in a world where content is infinite almost in many ways. So, I mean, it's exciting to think about. I can only imagine some form of combination of curation. We've got, you know, the old system of referencing as a way to determine value, you know, good old page rank from back in the day. Obviously, it's way more complicated than that from Google, but there's still that idea if an authoritative content creator links to and recommends your authoritative content, you rise up in the rankings. Now, in the future, we're going to see one AI authoritatively recommending another AI. (laughs) You know, I can see us not existing in this equation in some level, but like you said, the tools will determine how the the playground is is, uh, played in the future. But let's dive back. We got a lot of points here and we're we're already talking for ages. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, we'll speed up let's yeah. speed up <laughs> well it is a topic that we could postulate and never come to a conclusion because obviously we're, we're guessing on the future but there's some cool things you said so first of all one was blog posts and books and news articles will be written by robots by ai copyright will be a real challenge in this world but obviously copyright will also benefit from ai in the sense that we, have, like, we, we don't know, but there'll be tools to determine what's copyrighted and what's not based on how this all develops. Now, point three, and now, so I should also mention in point two, you talk about voice as a component, because that is, I think, a really important point to make. AI will be able to replicate voice. That's not something I thought about until Joanna Penn brought it up to me. And I was like, okay, wow, so they can actually replicate me in the way I sound, which is a big part or way I read, maybe. And I think, you know, let's take this a step further as we were about to talk about step three, voice synth technology will replace human narrators for mass market audiobook narration. And I'd like to take that a step further. In the future, that will also mean me and my voice right now talking to you on this podcast can be replicated as well, I would assume. It's an obvious conclusion too. So this podcast could be two AI robots talking about 
something, you and I wouldn't have to be here potentially as well. Do you see that future coming to continue this this point three onwards? <laughs> well, first of all, I got to pull you up on the use of the word robots because I'm flinching every sorry, time you say sorry. it. We are not talking about robots at uh, all in this podcast. Robots <laughs> being a physical object which may use AI, but we're talking about the software right, right. side. Yeah. Software so yeah, robots. voice in. Voice, yes, <laughs> voice synth technology. Okay, so what you've just said is can already happen. So if if you Google the deep fakes, if people haven't heard of the deep fakes, there's a Mark Zuckerberg deep fake. There's lots of Trump ones. Obviously, there's Obama. Essentially, right now, if there is over, let's say between eight and 20 hours of your voice, they can turn that, they being many of these companies. <laughs> the evil can, lords. <laughs> the evil overlords. Um, no, or you can indeed turn that into a voice synth. Let's call it a voice synth. I just made that up, but I don't know. So there are companies like Liarbird.ai, which is a wonderful company. So what they do is they are making voices for people, you know, like Stephen Hawking with ALS, who lose the use of their voice. So instead of having a robot voice, <laughs> I'm talking about robots, you can lend your voice to a project to help somebody have a voice again. So that's where Liarbird.ai comes in. Now, DeepZen.io is a company that is is making audiobooks based on voices and essentially training an AI to do text to speech in a more emotionally resonant way. Now, there is already a lot of text to speech out there. So Amazon Polly, you could plug Amazon Polly into your website right now and every single post will be audio. And Microsoft has a version, lots of people have these text to speech. That's not unusual. What is unusual is now the growing ability to actually create a version of your own voice or train a voice synth on, you know, other voices. So I see this as fascinating because I would love to license my voice. So I already narrate audiobooks. I've narrated my own audiobooks. And I think it's incredibly hard work. <laughs> it's really, really hard work. And I would love to have an AI that will read my audiobook or yours, if you like, Yarrow, will read it in my voice where I don't have to do the actual narration. Now, but you can see how that could disrupt the industry hugely. China already has AI news anchors. So these are avatars of actual news anchors who now work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because they are an AI avatar using a voice synth of the anchor's voice. And so I see the potential of this as it will make it a lot cheaper. So everything will be in audio. Everything that is currently in text will be in audio and vice versa. And that you'll be able to license a voice that you love. Not just that, say you're listening to one of my audiobooks, but you'd rather have it read by an American man rather than a British woman, you can just click a button or whatever on your phone or whatever device <laughs> and it will be reading to you in a different voice. So I, again, I see this as the potential for an explosion in creativity. And yes, the jobs will change. So if you're a narrator right now, I see the job will be more about editing and licensing. I think it will be a very interesting future. But yeah, I definitely see that as happening and it already is. So this this is something that I can say is not a 10 year horizon. This is this is happening. Mm. So you're saying not too distant future, or even possibly right now, we could have a AI generated visual and audio, the voice component reporter on the Wimbledon tennis match using footage from that match that was stitched together by an AI and using words that was written by an AI somehow. The thing I don't understand is how did the AI get the content about the match because they can't actually watch the mats and determine what why, point. Why, why can't they watch the match, well, Jerry? Well, how, how, how do they get the points from the match? Like, you know. But it, it's great <laughs> that you're using this tennis example because <laughs> yeah. you should go Google it after. It's really interesting. Okay. So essentially, they had all this camera footage that the AI managed to do a rough cut on because of the reactions of the audience. So that that could be translated into written words. So like the it would. Know. I don't even know, mate. We can't get too technical. <laughs> well, that's 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 <laughs> the one coming, thing missing, right? Back, yeah, but coming back on that, this is happening. If you just Google Chinese AI news anchor, or perhaps you can link in the show notes. So that is an example. So that's not making stuff up. That is actually happening. So 
I can see like it makes sense. You could have the cameras being operated by robots, actual robots in this case. <laughs> <laughs> the cameras content being edited by AI, the cameras content being translated into written words by AI. That's the part that still boggles my mind. I'm not quite sure how that would work. And then that content delivered and put together by an AI and then presented by a fake news presenter, a digital version of a human being. So you've got a complete end-to-end -end solution for essentially the journalist industry and media industry for covering sports, news, and so on, all done by robots and artificial intelligence. And that's not too far away by the sounds of things. Yeah, and I think this is an important point because what's happening at that moment to the sports commentators who are who know what they're doing is they are commenting on things that are not just a shot by shot play. So the psychology of what might be happening or, you know, whatever else emotions. they're commenting on. What about the yeah, emotions? The, the... the emotional side of it. And this is why this is so important. Don't think again, don't think of this like getting rid of jobs. I see this as changing the way that boring stuff is done. So for example, in the last month, I've started using Descript.com, which is a audio editing plus transcription site. It's absolutely fantastic. And suddenly I can edit my audio file with text. So I can just highlight things and press cut and it will edit my audio and also my transcript and it generates the transcript as well by AI, <laughs> I should say, within minutes. And so this has suddenly changed and made my own creation much, much easier. And I'm extremely happy. I'm over the moon by this. This is so exciting to me. And this is what I see for this type of technology is we're going to get far more people creating in different ways because the boring stuff can be done with a tool so much faster. Like, you know, you don't have to build a website with hand coded HTML anymore. You can just use WordPress.com or whatever, you mm. know. So again, I want people, including you, to think <laughs> these are tools that will make our process and our lives better. And yes, like the internet, let's say there's the dark side to the internet. But at the moment, all you seem to hear on the news is the dark side of possible AI. But this, what we're talking about for creators is an upside, a huge upside and a, a way, I think, to get rid of the boring stuff and do more of the exciting stuff. I love your uh, optimistic take on all of this, Joanna. It's, <laughs> it's important to have that. You made me think like how important, obviously, the aspect of copyright and licensing comes into this because that does sound like the only way to generate some kind of return on this is retaining some kind of ownership over an aspect of content, whether it's just the sound of your voice, like you were talking about yourself being a voiceover artist and licensing your voice, or whether it's the last, like the last step in the content production process might be to add some little element that only a human being can. I'm not sure what that might be. Maybe the, the AI people will say that's nothing that exists that an AI can't eventually do, that, you know, maybe there's some unique aspect to our creativity that can't be replicated, I'm not sure. And that could be the final secret sauce added to the potion that allows you to derive some kind of revenue from what you're doing too. And then it made me think, so I was actually, I think it might have been um, an AI newsletter I subscribed to, or could have been Peter talking about this, I can't remember, but AI judges in the law courts deciding the more simple parts of the judicial process so that the judges don't have to do the mundane. They can focus on the more complex cases like you're talking about, you know, making life easier by taking away the mundane. But if you extrapolate that further, we could have AI lawyers doing the AI disputes for these copyright claims between AI robots creating content and who has the licensing rights to certain types of voices, <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. And I just to add on another word that everyone loves is blockchain. Let's throw blockchain around. What the <laughs> okay. blockchain technology will enable us to do also is label this stuff through the chain. So once we are using blockchain as part of our creative process, that should mean that in some way your voice is tagged and that if somebody 
be used as an unlicensed Yarrow voice, that will come back to you somehow as a micropayment. But we can come back to that. I did just want to say on the what will be the human aspect. This is where I see the stratification of content coming in. So already you're seeing, yeah, sure, you can just have Amazon Polly read you some text from a screen. That can happen right now. But then do you want an emotional AI to read it in a far more human way? Or do you want the fully artisanal, human created process that has like a watermark on saying human created? Oh, wow. And, and yeah, but, but think about it. What this will mean is I would see this as it's like a mug, okay? I have a, I'm drinking from a coffee mug right now. And I, ha- I have a lot of coffee mugs because I drink a lot of coffee. Most of them are from factories. But I have one that is a handcrafted pottery mug. It's got flaws. It's got a quote on it. I got it from Seth Godin on one of his launches. It was, you know, limited edition, one of a kind, very expensive product. It was when I bought his huge, massive book along with some other stuff. And I drink from that cup every day. And that cup has emotional resonance, but I'm not going to buy all my coffee cups like that. So this is what I see. And I'm an audiobook listener right now. I am mostly, I am consuming nonfiction books where I really couldn't care who reads it to me. Like if they just tell me the information in a way that gets into my head and I often listen at times two speed or at least one and a half speed. So most of their performance is lost anyway. And then occasionally I will pay for a full production audio drama that, you know, has multiple voices, has music and sound effects, and it's a real experience. So again, there's this stratification of what the content will be. It doesn't have just to be one kind. It can be have the Yarrow watermark on or the special human mark. You see Mm, what I mean? Right. And that will be more expensive, whereas the cheaper stuff will be for people who just want the information. It's like the music industry, right? They, they've had this massive disruption where music basically became free and pirated and everywhere. So they no longer could sell records to make a living. So a the live music component became a big part and like the, the majority part of their income. So it's the experience with the human being then becomes the premium value. So everything else is so easy to get access to. You don't bother fighting it. And that's what you're saying here, right? So... I might have, here's like three tiers of my course. It's the AI generated one. It's the AI generated plus I edited one. And then there's the one where I give the the, the special show notes that I talk into the presentation that in like premium version experience with Yarrow and with the stamp really Yarrow, not Yarrow AI that made this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then that's where you put a few flaws in. I mean, hopefully people can tell this is not Yarrow and Joe AIs talking because we How have all the know? flaws. How do they yeah. know? <laughs> because of the flaws. We could be from the have... future. <laughs> from the... No, but there are flaws in our conversation. There, we don't. We're not. We are not speaking from a written text. We have some notes, but we're having a conversation, and we speak over each other. We interrupt each other. You know, there there are things that make it very clear. This is not being read from a text. So there are, yeah, and some people, I really think some people will prefer to listen to different types at different times. So this is this context idea. When you want information from WebMD, that's completely different from listening to an individual woman in her 40s who's had, you know, difficulties in this particular area. You know, the, it's it's all going to be different depending on a personal situation. But we should move on to voice search because this yeah, is important. Yeah, this, okay, well, yeah, we've only been talking for an hour. Let's keep going. This is a fun topic. So point four of nine, <laughs> uh, we have jumped ahead a bit though. Uh, voice search will disrupt tech text-based search engine optimization, SEO. And if you don't have voice content, you will be invisible. Now, I remember reading this one and I wasn't entirely convinced, so convince me. (laughs) Okay, so basically, and again, what's happened in the last month is that Google are now indexing podcast episodes. And as of uh, beginning of September 2019, they are only just starting to roll this out. So it's not in the UK where I am right now. This is, and it's only in English in the US. So they're slowly rolling this out in different countries and in different languages. And when I was listening to, um, I, I listened to Zach, the head of Google podcast, talk about this. And first of all, they were talking about how they want to grow voice. Now, there are lots of reasons for this. <laughs> but what was so fascinating is that they are putting it, if you do a Google search, you get videos at the top, 
then it will be podcasts, and then it will be text. Now, that order of serving your response tells me everything is that they still expect video to be the number one search but they expect audio to be the second and part of that is the rise in voice assistance and voice search so there are some estimates that up to 50 percent of search will be voice enabled from you know after sort of 2020 certainly going forwards so people will talk to their phone or they'll talk to their you know, device or whatever they're doing. And that's how they will search for things. And then if you search with your voice, you expect an audio response, right? You Mm. don't expect, I mean, maybe if you're holding your phone, but most of the reason we use voice is in order to actually, because we're doing other things (laughs) and we want to, you know, hear it. For example, I I had laser eye surgery (laughs) by a robot (laughs) um, (laughs) a couple of months ago. And I obviously um, had to have my eyes closed in, uh, in during a short recovery process so I was using my Amazon Alexa a lot so to talk to uh, and ask to get me stuff to get me the news to get me my audiobooks to you know read me different things play games with me it was a great chance to try that stuff out now again like me you're Gen X so we are not the target market for this, which is why I think so many people our age are not getting it. But older people, as soon as your eyesight starts going, you default to voice because most of these phones are way too small for people over 55, (laughs) for example. And then kids, what's happening in the younger demographic is most parents don't want their kids to have so much screen time. Mm. So they are pushing kids towards audio first content, which is why you're getting more stories, more embedded voice search and voice devices within toys and within, you know, everything now. And this is also part of Internet of Things. So It's not obviously the big companies, Google, Apple, Amazon, and then in China, we've got a lot going on. And then even the BBC just has announced a voice assistant here in the UK, and they are not cutting edge. (laughs) So this is a big shift in the way that people are interacting with the internet. And so what's going to happen is in the past, if somebody typed in, how do I become an entrepreneur, uh, maybe your site would have come up at the top of a text page, but where will it come up if they ask that by voice Mm. to Google Assistant or to Alexa or to someone else or to the BBC? It will serve different responses. So my point here is you and I are fine because we've had a podcast for however many years, but if you're listening and podcasting or audio is something you haven't done yet, I think this is the rise of podcasting. And you again, you and I have been doing it so long, we take it for granted. But at Podcast Movement, it was like, this is day one. Mm. Day one of podcasting starts now. And the amount of money flowing into audio first is huge. So yeah, I think I really think we have to be Jeff Bezos and say day one, this is this Mm. is starting again. Questions about that, Joanna. So I do remember when podcasting was getting started. I had my first show in 2005 and it wasn't even iTunes back then. And you wrote a blog post and you linked to an MP3 file and your blog post was obviously the part that got indexed and that was your hope of getting discovered. Fast forward a few years, iTunes comes out and suddenly it's all about ranking in iTunes search rankings to get your audio content found. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Why can't they index the podcast content itself? Oh, that's why you put a transcript. Okay, fair enough. That makes sense. But I think, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, first of all, I think it's crazy that it's taken this long to get podcasts listed in search results in the way you just described, you know, actually the audio itself in the search result. But Given everything we've talked about beforehand, doesn't this to me sound like it's a bit of a moot point because won't audio content be viewed as just words, as an article would be viewed as, as a video would be viewed as, as just words. So it's just going to produce what it considers the best answer to a question when it comes to voice search. Sure, the tool used to conduct the search is your voice, and that's a little bit new, not that new, but obviously it's getting way more refined as we get all these in-home tools to do voice search with and Internet of Things and so on. But the content it's indexing, it's just words. I guess I don't see the, the disruption here 
in terms of like, you know, you and I, sure, we've got podcasts, but at the end of the day, my X number of podcast episodes does not cover the same subjects that my X number of written articles cover, but I would see them all as the body of work of Yarrow that would all be searched equally. Maybe they'll be waiting, you know, if someone specifically wants to hear audio content. Well, I would argue my podcast isn't better because they could just have one of these voice synths to read out my article that sounds just as good as a podcast. So I guess I don't see the differentiation between a podcast and a written article in this new world we're talking about. Okay, so I know you're you're a quiet chap and so and I'm quiet as well. So we don't do this much. But if you ask, so you, if you say, hey, Google to your phone, mm. how do I become an entrepreneur? And you, or let's say you say it to your Google Assistant speaker. How many things will it return compared to a text? So if you do it in words, you'll get pages and pages, right, of results right. that you then scroll through. But if you ask that, say you're driving in your car and you ask that question, how many things do you get back? Well, I'm assuming it's going to give you the one best choice. Uh, but, yes. Uh, right. That is the change. That's a bit scary, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm glad you get this because <laughs> that's what I realized. And I went, aha. Uh -huh. So the point is, if someone's asking that question, and again, both you and I have a lot of content that is not in audio, how can it respond with, oh, here's the best text article from Yarrow on that topic? Can't you just read it out in a synthesized Yarrow voice? Yes, but you have to enable that technology. So this is one of the things that those of us who've been around a long time are going to have to look at, whereas mm. this is an advantage if you're starting now. If I was starting again now, I would be all in voice first, voice only, probably. I mean, I'll have a transcript, absolutely, but I would be I would be changing my... In fact, I have started a new site, booksandtravel.page, which is a voice first site. So if behavior changes like that, let's say it's 50%, and this is what I saw a year ago and went, okay, I need a new business plan. <laughs> <laughs> and also with, let's talk about coming back to books because I'm an author and I have like 30, 30 plus books at this point. They're not all in audio. So if someone is an audio consumer at this point, if the book doesn't exist in audio, it doesn't exist. People are consuming by audio only. And I, I'm increasingly moving into this way of consuming. So that's why none of your text-based posts will exist but when to I someone just flick who a only button, listens. Well, I, I want to just like, you, let the tool be turn everything I produce into a per perfectly synthesized Yarrow voice version well, of my written content. Flick. Yeah, but again, maybe... But the thing is, you... <laughs> We're not talking about a magic button here. I mean, you and I both know how to, what the back end of a WordPress site looks like. I mean, <laughs> we're at that point where we have to, let's say you do want to do that. So you would plug in Amazon Polly into those text posts. Well, you still have to do that. So that's the question. But wouldn't, but it, the, for, wouldn't the search engine potentially even like do it on their side? I mean, I know we're kind of jumping ahead in the sense that voice searches now and this sort of voice translation might be five, 10 years to get perfect versions of my voice mm. on all my content. But I would assume the, the production of the content would start to separate from the distribution of it in the sense that if I'm in my car and I ask the voice assistant to give me the answer to a question and I want it in video format, you know, it gives the best video produced result. But if I said I want an audio format, it could potentially pull from all the videos, all the audios and all the podcasts and just give it back to me in audio format with a perfectly, you know, I, I could have, uh, I want Morgan Freeman to read me the answer, you know, and it would well, just synthesize. And this, <laughs> this comes back to copyright. Right. And this is what's so interesting because, of course, when you do a podcast and you distribute it on a platform, you're signing a distribution deal for a particular thing. And this was an interesting question that came up at Podcast Movement. People said, OK, we understand that you are indexing audio by doing a transcription in the background, but we would really like that transcription for those of us who, who are paying for it. And they said, no, you know, we are never going to give you a transcription. It's a bit like the caption issue that I mentioned yeah. with Audible. So what you're talking about there, we this is why this is so fascinating and why we have to talk about it. And I mean, you and I are not decision makers in the world of AI, but it will directly impact us. So I don't know the answer, but if you think about what happens to index mp3 files they are making a transcript and they are then 
as you say, indexing words, but then they are serving the MP3. So if it doesn't exist as an MP3, will it come up as that? So the other question I imagine a lot of people are, want to ask as well is, what if you don't speak American English? <laughs> How mm. well will their transcription you know, work? So one lady said, you know, spoke up and said, I speak Jamaican a lot of the time, Jamaican English, and your transcription will not work out my language. And they said, yeah, over time, they're going to work on that. But this to me is why, again, we're at day one. So voice search and voice, the voice capture that we're seeing amongst smart assistants is all about this new world in the future. The more voices they capture, the better all of this is going to work. So right. the BBC one, for example, is using voices from all over the UK. And we have massive disparities between different accents in different parts of the country. So this will mean that hopefully this type of thing will get better. Mm. Yeah, so interesting. I, I feel like this goes back to the original problem I had with not having the ability to understand discoverability, because it sounds like, as you said, it's going to be the only one result rather than the top 10 of a Google search page that gets delivered to an answer to a query, which kind of harkens back to that. I remember a long time ago, I heard that I think internet marketers were talking about how with an intention deficit world that we live in online, people choose to go to fewer and fewer places for information. So the rich get richer, so to speak, you know, the most authoritative leaders start to get the lion's share of the audience because it's just too much work to try and research other things. So you just keep going to who you trust as long as they provide a certain level of, of information, right? So if you're a leader, you get bigger. If you try and, you know, compete or enter that space, it's almost impossible. And this sounds like it's going to even enhance that aspect because it's going to return one answer. So whoever controls the discoverability engines for this, you know, and they say like Google today, oh, you know, we no longer like this, switch it off, you know, or we, or we no longer factor in this value on or off. So we obviously you and I can only guess what that might be going forward, but it's certainly an interesting and very relevant for what we do because our content for it to be discovered, for new people to join my email list and buy a product or buy a book I release or whatever it is or a service I sell, it's all about being discovered in some way. And nothing has been as good as Google has been for me. So if I don't know how to benefit from whatever the search tool is of the time, as all marketers will have to, we struggle. So that's an interesting question to keep following, I guess, over time. But I think we need to move on because we're ready, probably pushing to be the longest podcast I've done in a while. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> or you can get the AI to edit it. It's fine. <laughs> True. Which reminds me, what was that tool you said you're using right now to, to edit the transcript and the words at the same time? It's called Descript.com. So D-E-S-C-R-I-P-T.com. Okay, we'll put that in the show notes, but that sounds really cool. Yeah, you could. Oh, by the way, you can get an affiliate link for it. So, uh, yeah, so every, everyone, you can get free free minutes if you if you sign up and share it with other people. It's a very smart model. <laughs> we'll look for your affiliate link, Joanna. We'll share it that way. Give you some <laughs> some free minutes. Okay, so I can see how this is coming together. This next point is almost like it's almost an obvious conclusion. Point five: translation will be performed by AI for books as well as other content. So I, I think. There's nothing to really argue over here. We've already been talking about content being produced in all these different formats, you know, transcripts, producing voiced audio. There's all the copyright issues, the licensing issues, the, the search and discoverability issues. And all this will do will mean language will no longer be a factor. That's the way I see yeah. it, right? Yeah. And just to say, again, this is already happening in a lot of ways in the business world. And I've just started doing it for my books. So there's a, a site called deepl.com. So D-E-E-P-L.com. And I'm doing this with German. So I've got three books right now that I, I uploaded my book in one minute. One minute later, <laughs> I got the whole book in German, no which way. I then down. Yep. One minute. It's, it's, it's shocking. How is it that really even is possible? Yes, that, this is this is why you should try it because it really makes you realize. So then what I did is I sent it to some German readers and basically got and some translators got some opinions on it. And essentially the general consensus was this is very, very good, but this is still 80%. Right. So it's an 80-20 thing. But that's already where we are right now. And again, this only really works for languages that are very common to translate between. So, you know, English to German is a very common thing. So what I've now done is I've paid a translator to edit those books 
firstly, you know, anything slightly weird. So, for example, German has uh, du and sie for the word you. So different forms of you, which we don't have in English. So that's something that needed fixing. Also, my voice, as we talked about. So how do we make this sound like me? But essentially, this is the work is changing from first draft translation to editing and curation. And again, if everything can be translated, then how do you differentiate? Well, you do that by voice and, you know, making things more nuanced, for mm. example. So again, right now, I'd say this is a majority nonfiction application, but there's no reason why in the future it, it might not change. But again, I see the work of a translator moving from first draft. And in fact, if you are a translator, you should be using tools like this to make your workflow much quicker right. and then just kind of editing the the translation. What was the name of that tool again? DeepL.com. So D-E-E-P-L.com. And it's only about seven euro to do five oh. books. Oh, God. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that's crazy. No. Nope. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a perfect example of that, like a tool creating the majority of the work. Well, okay, I'll be honest, editing is not much fun either, but it creates the first draft. So you're right. And it's just taking a lot of the mundane work off of our human plates. And then, you know, we have to do the finish line stuff, the final edit. What is interesting about that is like you were talking about the your voice thing. I used to remember thinking I was a huge fan of Paulo Coelho's writing when I was younger. And I remember thinking his writing style is, is so expressive in a way that I'd never come across any other author, the way he could make emotions come through words. And then I was thinking, but this is being translated from, I think it was a Portuguese original source. And it's like, how do they maintain that style from the Portuguese to the English translation? I always wondered how a person did that. I thought it must be a great editor, someone who really understands the source language and knows how to turn it into the English word. And then, of course, every other cross combination of language has to be considered the same. So, I mean, again, I'm like, how does AI get that ability? But I guess it's just a matter of time. Yeah, and I think language is a really interesting thing because there are a lot of rules. I mean, the 80-20 rule does apply in that a lot of words you are just translated. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and of course, nonfiction things are quite particular. It's the same with speech to text, you know, dictation. I found, and that's why Descript.com is so good, I found it to be almost perfect. And it's AI transcription that it does it again in about a minute. And so the, there are things that are, and I have a quite an obviously well-rounded English accent, so it's not going to struggle with my voice. But this is the thing, you know, translation is words. And then yes, those words need to be shaped and nuanced and all of that, which is where the art comes in. But it's funny because you don't have an issue with this like you don't seem to have any issue with this whereas you had massive issues <laughs> with cha with training an ai on your past history and then getting it to create and it's still that 80 20 rule so everything we've talked about i think it's a tool that will do a first draft and then you or whoever gets to shape it into the finished product well, I mean, yeah, that to me sounds like the st the stock standard answer for the near future. It's it's getting the the well, your the next point and the point after it. So, we've already covered point six. Content will explode exponentially, and AI discoverability and marketing tools will help navigate the tsunami. And we've kind of talked a lot about not really being able to guess what those discoverability tools and marketing tools will look like, but obviously those will grow as AI grows in general. So that to me is the most important question for us entrepreneurs and, and content creators and authors too, I would say, to figure out as things change. And then point seven, AI augmented creativity will develop and more people will want to be writers. So to me, the first part of that sentence makes sense, but then the more people will want to be writers part, I really would like you to clarify that. And I can really see how... Yeah, these last sort of three points all linked together as kind of the, I mean, that's really, they we're kind of answering all three questions. There's the AI doing the basics to the AI getting us, you know, 80% of the way to then will AI get us 100% of the way, not just augmented creativity, but creativity itself. That to me is like the final leap and can AI get us there? Well, I think 
when I'm talking about AI augmented creativity, I'm not just meaning writing. Although when I because when I say writers now, it's very interesting. With my podcasting, I now think about it as much more than that. So when I'm doing audiobooks, I'm writing differently for audio first product, for example. So my creativity is shifting into this multi-dimensional space. And obviously people can write play radio plays, they can write, you know, dramas for audio. There's lots of different forms of creativity that you can do when you have more tools. So what I see is, yes, there's a rise of Centaur publishing where, you know, maybe I can license 50% of Stephen King and 20% of Dan Brown and, you know, 20% Margaret Atwood and see what comes out. You know, that might be cool. There'll be, there will be, like there are now Centaur Chess and Centaur Go tournaments. There'll be different things like that. But also, create like for example this descript tool that i mentioned obviously i'm in love with right now i have wanted to do segment shows so using quotes from lots of different people in one show for years but the process of doing that is very hard but this makes it very easy because you can just copy and paste clips and so i'm suddenly i'm faced where i can create more because i have a tool that will help me do it and that's how i want people to think and so i think more people will want to be writers because they will be able to so speaking for example speaking is such a great way to write (laughs) it's so dictation is fantastic so if more people can start using dictation as the first draft of their written work and they can switch their brain into that mode I think that will uh, change things I also I can't even imagine but I think it's going to be very exciting there will be many more options so even down to right now you can do choose your own adventure Alexa skills, for example, I think augmented reality and virtual reality are going to bring whole new ways of telling stories. I mean, who would have seen the way Netflix and Amazon Prime and all of this would have brought a whole new era of TV writing? I mean, writing for TV is just exploding right now. So what I would say is this is, again, then tools will enable us to do far more than we ever could have done without the tools. Mm. I have a feeling we've we've had some people who just are feeling so overwhelmed right now <laughs> because <laughs> I even felt a little overwhelmed when you were just saying, oh, I can edit my quotes, you know, pull a, a sample from a previous podcast, put it into the next one and I can edit content, audio content much more easily. I'm thinking, but that is like, that's a big job just sitting there and picking the right quotes and getting like, I, I know from you know, editing video content. A lot of the videos I've chosen to done in recent years have been one take wonders. You know, there's no editing. It's just dump it and then away you go. As soon as I try to do any kind of, uh, let's do some B-roll, let's get some scenery shots. You know, it's like, oh, I know it's going to like triple the amount of labor that goes into the editing process afterwards. And in fact, I was just watching Jeff Walker, who you probably know very well from his product launch formula. And he's about to do his whatever 14th launch of this course that he sells every year. And he's doing live streaming video as part of his campaigns. But and he's also doing interviews with his case studies, you know, previous students who've done something amazing with uh, his training. And I thought it was an interesting comment he made. His his son does a lot of the production and video for it. So what they will do is have Jeff sit there and do the case study live, like a standard Zoom webinar room type video recording where it's just them having an interview. But what they do differently is they have multiple camera angles, which Jeff's son controls in the, you know, the video room, so to speak. And while it's live, his son will just press buttons to switch between camera views. So he doesn't have to go back and re-edit it. He edits it during the live recording so that he can then just, you know, have a finished product once the, or almost finished product once the interview is done. Now, obviously I can see that's a simple job for AI to possibly do as it's already doing for the tennis, right? Picking which, which bits of the tennis match and how to thread them together. I don't know where I'm going with this, but you know, <laughs> it, well, I am going with this. The tools sound amazing, but I'm feeling overwhelmed just with the few tools you've name dropped in this podcast, the uh, translate my book into another language, edit my podcast much easily, including editing the transcript at the same time, getting my voice translated or my content produced into to written uh, verbal content, audio content. I think you mentioned obviously at the beginning too, where I can take a few sentences of my written content and have an entire article written in my own voice. 
that in itself is too much. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So, well, what I would say, and um, and we went into this as we said, as this this to me is my ten year view. So, what happened this year is I hit my ten year anniversary um, and of course I learned from you back in the day and you know I still learn from you Yaro but when I look at my next 10 years I look at my business model right now and you know I make multi six figures I have a great business but I want to do this I want to be free for the rest of my life and so the reason I think you and everyone listening need to think about these things and it's not to jump in. So what you can think of here is this is an awareness podcast show today. <laughs> we are we are raising things in your mind that you may not have considered, but what is going to happen is a disruption of the old guard. And I don't intend to be the old guard. And I don't think you do either. I, fully I really am. Int- what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. And and well, and this is the other this is the other question then, because obviously you have to choose. So when I look at all this stuff, I am so excited. And this was actually the first time I thought about going back and getting a day job because oh, wow. realistically an individual and a solopreneur running companies like we do, we don't have the money for most of this stuff. If I was running a publishing company with hundreds of thousands of books right now, I would be doing a lot of very cool stuff, but I'm not. So the whole point of this is to think about, well, what is my business plan for the next 10 years? And I'll tell you, the number one thing on my business plan was invest. (laughs) 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 It was actually to buy more index funds in markets that will be most affected by these things. So this is not a financial show. This is not financial advice. But yeah, obviously, you can't do all this stuff. But what you can do is think about, well, if the world does go this way, then what are some of the ways I can position myself so I can continue to have the lifestyle that I love and continue doing what what we want to do? You know, that that that's music to my ears now as I listen to you and I've I've probably had more of an invest focus, even a diversification focus with starting other companies and so on for the last maybe four or five years and far less focus on this world of, of content production. But I go back to 25 year old Yarrow and he's like, I, that advice is useless. I can't, I don't have money to put in ETF funds like that. You know, I, I need to be the creator with something new. And uh, I would be like, listen to this podcast going, I'm not sure the solo contentpreneur is still an option in 10 years time. You know, like that, that's, mm. that's well, again, thing. I come, come back and say, I, as part of my 10 year anniversary, I started a new website, booksandtravel.page, which is podcast first. So I've just done that with a new brand. So completely new website, zero traffic, new start, because I believe that audio first is the way that I'm going. I'm building a voice, more of a voice brand, narrating my own audio books. And I intend to keep creating books and podcasting and blogging. So I think now, as I said, with podcasting, if I, well, I am starting again, it's podcast first. So if you're listening and you don't know what to do, then I would suggest learning about podcasting and audio. It's a nice, simple tip. I would end it there. We have two more points to talk about still. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can talk about them very quickly if we you can, like. Um, shall I just, so number eight, I've said print publishing will shift into a green sustainable model with AI assisted micro print on demand. So this is very publishing specific, but as you know, the world is shifting to a more eco environmental focus with climate change and lots of issues. And at the moment, a lot of print publishing is massive print runs and printed in China. <laughs> the Trump's tariffs are actually going to affect the publishing business quite soon oh, wow. um, as they are imports from China into the US. Um, but essentially, the price of paper has also gone up. So this is going to change. Um, but that is very publishing specific that won't impact most people. I think. Is there anything you want to say on that one? No, I mean, I, the only thing I think is interesting there is this idea of, uh, it's like the long tail of printing, right? You're getting one, that well, was long tail of production. In the digital world, there's a long tail of content consumption. You know, we, we can find a niche article on a niche subject or a video or a podcast, whatever. Now you're saying in the physical world, it's very much the case too, where if you want a resource, you only create one version of it. And you can imagine this extending to other things. Imagine like custom cars, 
You know, you don't have to get one of the mm -hmm. 20 versions of a car because they only have 20 different colors. It could be because it's a car with, uh, let's not go here, but we've got, you know, print on demand. We've also got, uh, what's the 3D printing, right? So that could lead to that being part of this equation too. Everything, well, the way I see this going actually, and this could be the, the bright utopian future. I'm not sure how exactly, but everything is tailored and customized to the unique individual human being, the content, the way things are produced for you. It's all just designed for Yarrow and Joanna and it'll be all unique and special and we consume a unique Absolutely. version of the content too. So, <laughs> Absolutely. And then um, number nine, expansion of mobile reading plus micro payments enabled by 5G mobile and <laughs> blockchain technology. <laughs> These are all just buzzwords now. Uh, yes. <laughs> plus four billion new people online equals an explosion of reading and new models of monetization. So let me just explain my thinking here. So basically, if you read Peter Diamandis Bold and his new book that's going to be out in 2020, his, and this is where I, I come from, this feeling of abundance, which is at the moment, you and I and everyone listening are generally in countries where the internet has matured in a certain way, where digital uh, online shopping has gone in a certain way. But what is about to happen from 2020, certainly by 2025, is the whole world is going to be online generally through a mobile device. So this is a mobile first world where if you add on the translation aspect, all these people <laughs> will be coming online looking for information, many of them wanting to become an entrepreneur or write a book or all of these things because people are people, right? So what is so interesting to me is this rise of micropayments in China. So China and Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, a lot more mobile first economies where people are doing micropayments through their cell phones. And we just don't really have that in US, UK, Canada. You know, we just don't have that. We don't have WeChat and, and all of those type of payment system. So I see new models of monetization for our content coming. And what I've learned through things Things like Patreon is people want to support creators. And there are writers in China who are making a lot of money from micropayments based on their writing of stories, for example, stories that go, go on forever, they're getting micropayments for. So what I want to encourage people is this expansion and abundance that is coming of more people and the expansion of at least 4G to the whole world by 2025. This is very exciting. So don't just think that your market is people in America or wherever you're from. You know, I have people in 218 countries have downloaded my podcast. So that's pretty much all the countries in the world. Mm. <laughs> So that's what I want you to think. This is so exciting. I agree. I love, again, the positivity, Joanna. It's fantastic. It, this reminds me almost of what 10, even 20 years ago, when we first started talking about the internet in general, it was a similar idea. Then things like the long tail, 1000 True Fans, all these ideas of it's no longer one or two or three big hits getting global expansion because it's played on the radio or video hits in the morning. It's about you finding your niche little audience online, your niche reading audience in the case of books, or as an entrepreneur, you might sell something that you create, but you have a micro payment customer base of a thousand customers distributed around the world. What I am curious about, and I think this is the unanswerable question that I will continue to look, uh, maybe I'll look to you, Joanna, for an answer now, now that you're an AI expert, is the, the marketing side of this, the discoverability side of this, because I love the tools of micropayments. I love the idea of a distributed world of being able to sell things as I have, as you have for many years, selling our, our teaching products around the world. But if we're continuing down this path, as you're saying here with mobile, blockchain, micropayments, there has to be a way for people to discover us still. So I'm really curious, like, you know, is it going to be like a, I do a video on, on TikTok, which leads to someone buying something from me, you know, for $5, whatever, something mm. unique I make. And that's, that's the future for an entrepreneur online, you know. I'm personally a fan of being everywhere and I'm pretty much am everywhere. I publish on every possible platform. You can use Streetlib, it's like called Streetlib to publish even into countries that you might never have heard of. But yeah, absolutely, you have to figure this out. But what it's so funny you mentioned going back to the long tail and all of that, because that's totally where we're living now, obviously. Right. But it's funny because there's a book that just has just come out that I just read, fantastic books called Marketing Rebellion by Mark Schaefer. Have you seen that? No. 
it's really new. So I recommend that to everyone. But he brings up in the first chapter, the Clue Train Manifesto. Oh, old school. I know. So yeah, really old school. So 20 years ago, the discussion was personalization, be you, all about voice, all about yeah. individually individual targeting, all about no pop-up ads, you know, very much returning to old school marketing. And this is what I saw at podcast movement around radio networks and big companies trying to work with podcasters because they found that the trust has disappeared from or is disappearing from big media, big companies, people whose voices they don't trust anymore. So yes, all of these things are a challenge. But again, I would return to double down on being human, personal brand, and embracing the tools and using the tools as they appear. And this is what I'm doing. So like I just said, I've, I've only moved, I only found out about Descript a couple of weeks ago, and I've moved to using that now. I'm obviously now looking at how do I work with voice search, that type of thing. But this is why this is so fun, Yarrow. We have to keep <laughs> learning new things. If we didn't have to learn new things, we would be bored and we would get out of it. Now, I, you know, we all have to decide what we want to focus on. But this to me, this is super exciting. So yeah, I just urge people to remember that the attitude of ever learning is the attitude of an entrepreneur. Mm. And I think I'd like to add for the people who are entering this world, perhaps with nothing, <laughs> no money, no brand, no, no presence online, as Joanna did 10 years ago, as I did 15 years ago, whatever it is, there's always the conditions you face in the current space that you're operating in and that's just a given you have to work with what you're where you're you know it's a, is it crowded is it not crowded what tools are available etc but that doesn't matter because that's always the case i think what really I, and i can say this now with a reasonable long career in the internet space there is always something new and there's always people who ride these new waves too i remember the podcast is getting huge results in sort of 2010 2011 and before that was the youtubers uh, or after that and you know, there was the facebook people and the snapchat people and, the, and there's always a new transforming tool uh, there could be some new technology behind it and those are opportunities. I think that's like to continue with your optimistic beat that you've been consistent on throughout this whole talk, Joanna. All these things you've talked about are disruptive and they may seem like they're overwhelming. I know I feel that way sometimes, but so did the idea of an internet in general at the very start. You mean all this content's out there, all this music's for free. What it ended up doing was creating huge opportunities for people like myself and yourself to create these small businesses. And I think what will obviously happen is what we did back then won't work in the same way it did, but you'll use the new tools to tap into the same basic ideas of meeting people's needs and wants and desires and passions and all that. And the technology just makes it more friction free to do that. The trick will be to be like Joanna and stay on top of all this and, you know, <laughs> play with the tools when you see an opportunity to really go all in and go deep with it, as you did as a early adopter of book publishing through the internet and being a teacher and coach, as I did with blogging, you know, those are opportunities that were windows in time. So if anything, mm -hmm. listening back to this podcast and grabbing on to one or two of the concepts that you've talked about is an opportunity for a business, right? Like helping people with voice search. That could be a, a massive coaching option coming up in the very near future, for example. Mm, absolutely. And yeah, I think that's a great idea. There is so much. In fact, I, after I got excited about this, I started a whole load of, like you do, buy a whole load of URLs because you get so excited about the new businesses. And then I was like, no, calm down. <laughs> focus on, <laughs> focus, on focus, focus. You, yeah, focus, focus, focus. But also another important thing is curation. I don't expect you to be learning all this stuff, you listening or you, Yarrow. I mean, listen Thanks, to Jenna. curators. <laughs> so, for example, if you are interested in how this affects you as a writer or a publisher, pretty much every week on my podcast, I have a futurist segment because this is my interest. So I curate things every week for my audience at the Creative Pen podcast. And I have occasionally I'll have a much bigger interview. So, for example, I interviewed Marcus de Sotoy about the creativity code, which actually was a whole 
whole interview about creativity and AI. And then, of course, you could pick other like Wired magazine. I absolutely recommend Wired magazine for keeping up to date on some of the fascinating things across many different industries. And this is also why this is important. It's not just the digital industries or the creative industries. This is this is across so many different industries. So, yeah, I would recommend Wired as a way to kind of keep up on all of those. Awesome. Okay, Joanna, where can we keep up with you to get on to this, the podcast and the, the blog posts not, and the book <laughs> publishing side, but the futurist side, everything you're doing right now? Yeah, so come on over to thecreativepen.com, pen with a double N. I'm on Twitter at thecreativepen with a double N. And as I mentioned, the Creative Pen podcast, which I, I'm on something like 450 episodes now, like you, we've been going a long time, but still uh, loving that. Awesome. Well, thank you, Joanna, for coming on the show. I honestly, thinking back the first time we did this interview, I would have never have guessed I'd have you back on the show to talk about AI. I did not see you <laughs> going me, down that not path. Me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks for having me, Yarrow. No, thanks for coming, and uh, thanks for listening, everyone. I used to do customer service myself entirely through email. And at first I really loved it. I was replying to potential customers and current customers, answering their questions, convincing them to buy from my business. And it was fun. But then eventually I started to get a little overrun with a lot of queries. A lot of people you know, asking me about my products and services, whether it's right for them. And then a lot of technical issues would come in like, you no, know, a link is not working on my website or how do they access this resource? Or, you know, where can they download that? Or they can't open a PDF. And these kind of emails kept coming in day after day. And eventually, the more successful I got, the more of these emails I got. And I got really tired of replying to the same questions over and over again. Now, I knew that I could start building, you know, template replies to answer the most common queries, which I did. But I very quickly became overrun with this job. I'd wake up in the morning and I have to spend three hours just replying to messages. And, you know, there were a lot of important messages in there, a lot of potential customers I could be losing if I don't reply reply to those emails with a good, thorough, carefully crafted email to give them the information they need. So I was concerned if I stop doing this, my business is not going to work, yet I'm getting less and less time in my life to do anything else other than email. So that's the day I realized I needed to bring on someone else to help me with this very important customer service role, handling the email in my business. And that's why I'm so excited today to introduce you to a new sponsor of this podcast podcast, inboxdone.com, which is a service where you can bring on board a person to take over email in your business and your life. And I want to highlight how important that is to bring on a person who can take over customer service in your business, in particular, email customer service. So if anything I said there resonated with your current situation with how you deal with email, you know, you're getting a lot of those kind of queries and you're feeling like you're potentially missing out on business or you're not doing as good a job as you could dealing with really important queries from people who potentially want to buy from you or even current customers who have bought from you or the more mundane queries like I can't open this PDF or this link gave me a 404, I can't find this resource kind of emails. They're boring, but it's important you've got someone who's answering those questions and not only answering them, but building systems, creating templates and automatic sequences of emails that chase up potential customers or deal with potential refunds, processes to really deliver deliver exceptional customer service. And all of this can be happening without you being the person delivering those emails or writing those emails or creating those templates. Certainly not the person who logs in every day and puts in all this time to deal with something that is never going to end. You're always going to get email as long as you have a successful business. And in fact, you're only going to get more and more as you become more and more successful. So I recommend if this is your situation, you check out the inboxdone.com service and hire a someone who can essentially become your entire customer support team just by hiring this one person from Inbox Done to take over email in your business. Now, it can do a lot more than that for you, but I recommend to find out all the details, just go to inboxdone.com, check out the website, and you'll find an application form there where you can apply for your very own email inbox manager who could take over customer service in your business, which would potentially can change your life. You can take this completely off 
your plate and go to sleep relaxed, stress-free, knowing that customer service is being handled by a dedicated person whose job is to deal with those emails every day for you. That's inboxdone.com. Go check them out. Thanks for listening to Yaro's podcast. For more episodes, visit yaro.blog and subscribe on iTunes or Google.